In this episode, you're going to learn how to overcome the limiting perspectives on design and how you can gain the superpower to not solve problems, but let them dissolve. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Arash, and this is episode 124 of the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark, and welcome to the Service Design Show. On this show, we explore what's beneath the surface of service design. What are the hidden and invisible things that make a huge difference between success and failure, all to help you design services that make a positive impact on people and business. The guest in this episode is Arash Golam. He's a teacher, a writer, and most of all, a systems thinker. You might have heard about the hero's journey. Well, in this episode, we're going to talk about the designer's journey. We're going to explore systemic design. We're going to talk about understanding people and knowing yourself as a designer. I walked away from this conversation with Arash with a much greater awareness of what it truly means to be a designer. And I hope you'll walk away with the same. This is one of those episodes where everything is interlinked and I can imagine that you might even want to listen to this twice. There's just so much in here. And as a follow up, we're going to do a webinar where you'll be able to ask questions and dive deeper into the topics we've discussed here in this episode. If you want to see the details for that webinar, check the show notes. Depending on when you're listening, you might still be able to register and join us live or you might be able to catch the recording. If you're a service design professional who enjoys conversations like this, make sure you click that subscribe button and that bell icon because we bring a new conversation every two weeks for the last five years. So click that subscribe button. Now it's time to sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Arash Golam. Welcome to the show, Arash. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's a pleasure. Yeah, it's a milestone episode, uh, 124. Uh, this is the episode uh, five years plus a few days after the first one came out. So uh, you're here. <laughs> well, I'm very happy to be able to mark this milestone with you. I, I hope we'll uh, have another five years of the Service Design Show uh, running mm -hmm. and at some point we'll actually get to episode 250. Uh, seems far away, but we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Ar Arash, um, we're going to talk about a super interesting topic. I think it's a topic um, that hasn't been covered a lot on the show. But before we dive into that, I can imagine people would like to know a little bit about your background. So could you give a brief introduction into who you are and what you do? Yeah, um, I'm Arash. I'm originally from Iran. I've been in Switzerland for the past 12 years. Um, I have a background in engineering and in industrial engineering and then in management and management of technology. Then I switched into mathematics, applications of mathematics for uh, simulation of complex and adaptive systems, a field that is called system dynamics. And um, afterwards, um, I again switched lane and went to the psychoanalysis field. So um, I'm now for about three and a half years, a psychoanalyst in training and starting from summer, I can start my private practice in psychoanalysis. Hmm. And yeah, this is my, my educational background. Not a typical service design background, at least not, not, the, not the one I've been hearing about. So uh, wondering what our chat will bring. Um, mm -hmm. Arash, for, uh, for the past few episodes, we've been doing a question rapid fire round. Um, and I'm going to do the same with you. So I'm going to ask you five questions. And uh, your task is to answer them as quickly as possible. Okay. Okay. We'll do my best. Uh, le let's give it a go. Question number mm -hmm. one is, what's always in your fridge? Can you come again? Yeah. What's always in your fridge? Oh, uh, what's always in my fridge? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, I like hummus a lot. I'm a vegetarian and I make sure I keep a good... Um, Stack of hummus in my fridge. Yes. We've added that one to the list. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, which book are you reading at this moment, if any? Well, I'm reading actually, one of my problems is that I cannot focus on one thing. So right now I'm reading a number of books at the same time. 
I am uh, going through the works of William Blake, the poet. At the same time, I'm reading a book on chaos and order. I'm reading a book on designing social systems as well. And basically, I'm also preparing for my examinations in psychoanalysis. So there's a couple of books on psychodynamics that I'm going through. So this well, is the I, challenge yeah. I face. <laughs> uh, well, add a few interesting links to the show notes. Um, <laughs> Now, with your diverse background, I'm really curious, what superpower would you like to have? Um, inspiration, basically. Um, being able to be inspired by the mundane and being able to inspire people. Mm. This, is, this is, for me, uh, the most important thing. This is why we're here, I would say. Cool. Uh, sounds very exciting. Um, mm -hmm. Question number four is, what did you want to become as a kid? Writer. I wanted to become a writer. Yeah. And I think you've partially managed to actually do that looking on your I'm, blog. <laughs> yeah, I'm working on it. I've published a lot of book chapters, academic ones, but right now I'm working on my first book, and which is at the intersection of systems thinking and, and design thinking. So mm. it's, it's work in progress. And moving on to the question, the final one uh, is, when did you first encounter service design? Well, it was during my PhD years, actually. Um, I, I did some work on systemic uh, design and systemic service design, but it was not in any way attached to the school of thought that we have right now in design thinking. So it was basically uh, producing some systems models that could capture the essence of design when it comes to a service. So I published quite a few of articles um, uh, in that field of systemic design and systemic service design. And that was the first time I came across the field. Uh, that goes back to 2009, actually. And you already um, mentioned a few terms that we'll be using a lot in this uh, episode. So to start unraveling where our conversation uh, will be heading is when I uh, was preparing my notes, sort of the final conclusion for me was that we'll be exploring the limit, limited perspectives on design that we have today and how we can break out of that um, and what the consequence is of our current perspective on design, right? Would you agree that that's going to be the main topic? Absolutely, yes. Mm. And uh, the, another thing I had noted here was... Uh, this is like the classic quote, and I'm not going to memorize it perfe perfectly, but it's about we cannot solve uh, the problems from within the context that they've been created, right? That's mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of uh, yeah. thing we'll be addressing. Mm -hmm. You mentioned two key terms uh, already, systemic design and systematic design, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Can you explain the difference between both so that people like me understand? Yeah, um, you know, the difference goes back to the difference between the two words, systemic versus systematic. Many people use these two words interchangeably, but there is a big difference. Systematic means you are following an orderly sequence of process steps. First this, second that, third and fourth. A recipe. Most of the times... Right. Yeah, a recipe, a sure. procedure, yep. process steps in a linear fashion most of the times. And this is what we have, you know, in the field as, okay, empathize, define, ideate. It's very systematic. You follow a procedure. Systemic uh, basically comes from the word um, system, and it has to do with changing of the system, right? So systemic design does not mean that you follow a process step. It means that a design that somehow targets the system as a whole, not targeting a fragment of the system, not targeting a problem within the system, not targeting an improvement that we need to bring about. It's about the system as a whole. And that's why we call it systemic design. And systemic design would be related to something that I've encountered a few times, uh, systems thinking, uh, right? That's, I guess, related to that specific absolutely. field. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Yeah, I would say systemic design is the marriage mm -hmm. between systems thinking and design thinking. So if they, the, the product of this marriage will be systemic design. Cool. Um, now, 
before we unravel and unpack what's uh, in this uh, topic, I'm curious, where did your journey start to trying to unravel this, explore this topic? Um, how did you stumble upon this? Well, you know, it goes back to my bachelor's years when I was studying industrial engineering. We had a course in systems thinking. And there, for the first time, things started to click for me. You know, I was exposed to a set of, uh, let's say, techniques and mental models that could um, somehow alter the way I was looking at my environment. And I could suddenly see things I couldn't see before. I could ask questions I would have otherwise not asked. So that really sparked an interest in me from, from early years in my bachelor's program. And then I followed this systems thinking school or paradigm. I wouldn't call to, I wouldn't like to call it a discipline because it's basically a meta-discipline. It's a trans-discipline. Hmm. And yeah, this is something I followed during my master's studies for my PhD uh, dissertation at EPFL, Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, or the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. I worked uh, with uh, systems thinking again. Then I went into the quantitative part of systems thinking, which is system dynamics. And I followed that branch of systems thinking as well. So I've been somehow involved in it. And at the same time, I realized that there is more to systems thinking than uh, we have defined as disciplines. If you really want to understand it, you have to transcend the disciplines in which it's being applied, or, it, or they have the word systems or thinking in them. And for instance, psychoanalysis is a great work of systems thinking, understanding the relationships between subsystems within us and how they result in emergence of personality. This is a marvel of systems thinking work, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, already a lot of questions on my mind. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things I would like to uh, understand uh, before we get into the benefits of using uh, systemic thinking and systemic design, you already hinted upon it's like it helped you to ask different questions, but what do you feel are the limitations within our current perspective on design? Um, I would say the fact that we start with the with a statement of a problem without being able to question that problem and um, somehow uh, overturn it completely. So, okay, you know what? That's not the actual problem that we need to address, right? Um, that, is, that is one of the, I would say, one of the limitations that we have currently. Um, the other thing that I think is a limitation is that we are treating design thinking as a discipline, you know? The same as systems thinking, in my opinion, it should not be treated as a discipline. It's an intersection of various disciplines. And for me, that includes uh, psychology, that could include, uh, uh, let's say, operations research to some extent. It could include uh, mythology, eth ethnology, right? Uh, so this is, this is various fields that come into an intersection, and that intersection is design thinking. It's not a road on its own. That limits us, because when you look at it as a discipline, this discipline should provide you with theory, with, let's say, frameworks, with tools, and it doesn't. Right? And then that's why we are dealing with templates, which are predefined sets of concepts off the shelf. Right? So this is another limitation. In my opinion, we need to be equipped with, uh, let's say, the set of conceptual tools and techniques to create our own tools if you want to embark on a journey of design. So being fed with a problem statement, this is what you need to do. And these are the tools you need to use to do that. I think there is two ways that uh, basically creativity, visioning, intuition of, uh, of the designer will be hampered, in my mm. opinion. Mm. Um, I would say that uh, and design thinking isn't a, a term that I like to use. I just read a mm. stick to design, but I know a lot of yeah. people use the, the term design thinking. Um, but you mentioned something uh, about not having the opportunity to sort of uh, frame the problem, you start with a problem statement, isn't one of the first things people do in the design process to re-evaluate if they are solving the right problem? I would say um, that should be the way 
it's done, mm -hmm. right? Um, I give you an example. Um, in education, for instance, this is a service that I'm very familiar with, and it's, it's a service that is very valuable, in my opinion, especially these days. Um, we, had a, we had a situation when, when there was COVID, examinations, the, the usual way of uh, giving exams could not be implemented anymore, right? Because the students could not be uh, supervised during the exam session and so on and so forth. So we had a problem, quote unquote, right? The problem was that some of the teachers were using multiple choice questions for their examinations that came from the textbooks that they were uh, basically using for their courses. And now they couldn't actually do those type of examinations as the students were home because easily they could consult their books or exchange messages with their with their classmates through a wide variety of uh, tools, applications online, so on and so forth. So there was a problem. What would what we do? And then there were a whole bunch of different solutions that were offered, how the problem could be addressed. One was, and they somehow uh, went and subcontracted a company that would block the freeze the students' uh, screen so that they could not launch any other application or anything like that. That would, in my opinion, be a problem solving. But then, of course, students can have multiple devices. There is nothing you can do about that. That's not a very efficient way of doing it. I would say you would ask the question um, instead of saying, what would I do so that I could supervise the exams the same way as I would in a, in a physical, let's say, examination setting? Um, I, would, I just told them, how about we design the exams in such a way that the students cannot cheat, right? Yeah. That's, I would say, that's a different approach. That dissolves the problem. It doesn't solve the problem, right? right? So I would say systemic design deals with dissolving the problem by coming up with a design of, of the system that has the problem, with a new design of that system, so that the problem disappears, basically. Mm. Mm. So this is, this is what I mean by questioning it. Not only different dimensions of the, of the, of the problem at hand, but the essence of the problem, yeah. whether that is what we need to work on uh, at all. Yeah. So, uh, and I recognize this from my uh, own practice, is at some point, it's at the start usually, it's really good to ask the question, why are we actually doing this? So we're, uh, in your example, examining students with a certain, for a certain reason. And if you start to question if that's actually still relevant and important, yeah. then... If the answer is no, then you don't have to design a solution to actually examine the student. And that's, I think, the thing you're hinting at is you, you can solve the problem by letting it dissolve and not be a problem anymore. Exactly. exactly. If, if, if your goal is to help students become smarter and wiser professionals or something like that, then there are different, then that opens up new opportunities to find ways to do that. Absolutely. And you know, when you, when you start this line of, uh, uh, let's say, investigation, then you get to some really crucial points. Then you, you're wondering, what type of skill set should the educator possess to be able to design exams in which the students cannot cheat? Even if you give them the questions a, a, a day before the exam, they can just consult anyone they want and so on and so forth. But there is the act of cheating is not possible. And this requires a whole new way of looking at education. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you cannot just deal with a fragment of education, which is examination or evaluation of performance. You know, And, and a cheating is a symptom within the system rather than Absolutely. Uh, the, the problem. Um, Absolutely. So th this reminds me of, uh, uh, I think it's the model by Richard Buchanan, the four levels of design where you sort of uh, eventually have to zoom out and start thinking on which level of design am I acting. And the level mm -hmm. that we're talking about in this case is, I think, defined as level four, the systemic level. And uh, it's really important that you ask yourself on which level can this or should this challenge solved exactly I, I really agree with this different levels of understanding when it comes to a phenomenon you can you can treat symptoms as you said symptomatic solutions you know suppressing the symptom for a short while before it comes back stronger in a different form right 
Uh, that's why we say the act of solving problem is, des is designing new problems. So you design new problems at the same moment you're solving a problem. That's, that's event level interventions, uh, suppression of symptoms. Then we have patterns and, and, and trends in which these trends, these, these events belong to. You know, you have to be able to see them as a, in the broader scheme of things. Patterns of behavior that can, these events can be singled out of, right? Then we have structures that give rise to those patterns, right? There is a structure that is producing multiple patterns. One of those patterns, right, is the pattern that is relevant to the event that is right now uh, the, the, the event of interest. But then at the very bottom of, of, of these layers is the mental model, is the worldview, is the paradigm that gives rise to the design and the generation of that structure. Hmm. So act of systemic design cannot proceed without dealing with that bottom, you know, that really crucial point of high leverage, which is very subtle, very subtle, you know. And and that the that level of paradigms, mental models, perspective, is where you sort of see the uh, deficiencies of our current design methodologies and tools. They don't yes. allow us to address these challenges at that level. Yes, there is two reasons, Mark. In my opinion, one is that there is a lot about the service. You know, we, we, we talk a lot about a service or a product, right? But, um, you know, there's a field called phenomenology. In phenomenology, your interest in a phenomenon is about anything but the phenomenon itself. So, especially in human activity systems or social systems or socio-technical systems, how people perceive something, how people derive meaning or attribute meaning to something is the crucial thing. It's not about the thing. It's about the perceptions of that thing. It's about the attribution of meaning. So we need to work with that point of view. But if you're in an engineering technical system, for instance, the design of a, uh, let's say, production line, it's about that. It's about that artifact of design that we are thinking about, we're talking about, right? In human activity systems, on the other hand, we need to work with those perceptions. We need to find a way mm. to understand them, right? That's the first thing that we're not doing. In my opinion, we, there's a lot about the technicalities around the service and the methods that we are using are, are all a lot about the service as if there mm -hmm. is an objective reality out there. And, you know, for instance, one of the tools we use is called service bl blueprints. Blueprint is a word that is borrowed from engineering and technical drawings. So it shows that the, the metaphor we are using is at the level of technicality of the service, not at the level of subjectivity around it. And I, I think I understand what you're saying there, and I'm starting to think that the thing that we're designing, or, uh, or at least most of the people who are listening uh, to the show, are services, and services are produced by organizations. Organizations are factories, uh, have processes, are driven uh, by these kind of uh, yeah, processes. So it's natural to think that that's the uh, object of design, the process, the, the, the interactions, the environment. And uh, I can imagine it's hard to step out of that. Like you're, as a designer, you're in that environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's difficult to switch the perspective. And, and you know, to be fair, that's the easy bit. When you're dealing with processes, you know, with technical components, that's easy to manage, that's easy to model compared to the, the ephemeral uh, perceptions of individuals that changes over time, right, quite rapidly, right? So those are the things that are difficult to work with. There's a Sufi story that, you know, there's a, there, was a, there was a person looking for his keys for a, for a while. People notice and ask him, what's happening? What, what's wrong? He says that, well, I'm looking for my keys. They say, where have you lost them? He says, I've lost them here. And they say, where are you looking there? He says, because here, uh, there, for instance, there, actually, there is more light. Here is darker. So there is no chance that I can find them here. So these things are a bit more in the shadow, and they are dark, and they are subtle. They're difficult to be observed, you know? So, and yeah, got it. And, and then um, 
my my uh, pragmatic mind uh, steps in here, and I'm I'm thinking. Let's go back to your education example. Um, the thing that you're asking or advocating for, as far as I can uh, understand, is at some point you have to start questioning the educational system rather than trying to improve the way we uh, sort of educate at this moment. You have to sort of think. Why are we educating? What is the goal? And then uh, that's quite a hefty challenge. And uh, where would you even start with something like that as a designer? Well, it's a very good question. And I think it's a very relevant challenge right now. Um, I would say one, one thing we're suffering from in education is fragmentation. So we have a lot of fragments. In, in an educational system. If you look at um, an MBA program, students in that MBA program go through as many as 20 modules. And there is not a module that connects these modules. So they go learn fragmented pieces of information. But in reality, is not fragmented. In reality, you face uh, interconnected holes. Okay, that's one thing. Second problem that we have is basically the topic-based approach. We have topics. I think education, in a, if, if education is to be designed in a systemic way, we have to transition from topics to skills. What skills do we want individuals to be equipped with? And skill is basically a tangible capacity to carry out, let's say, a task, right? An intellectual task, let's say, in our uh, education world right now. And skill-based education is different because the whole setup will be different. If we want the individuals to be able to carry out the specific, let's say, tasks at the end of their education, we need to align all the modules so that that is basically accomplished at the end of the day. It's, uh, imagine you're designing a house. You're not designing a house as a set of rooms. It's okay, I'm going to design a set of rooms and then miraculously the house is going to emerge. You think what type of let's say, feelings or impressions the people who will be residing in this house will, will need to walk out of this house with, okay? You start with that. What do I want to give them as a designer? And then you start playing around with the space. You start differentiating space, right? And you never improve a room unless it improves the house, right? You always have the house, that totality of the space in mind when you start with working with the rooms. Unfortunately, the way we are working in education is we are working with the rooms and there's no vision of the house at all in our mind. And, and, and this sounds a lot like service design for me because the rooms you describe are the, maybe the individual touch points. So what you want to do is you are, want to create a holistic experience. And you said you always design with the entire house in mind. I would go even a step further. You're designing with the feeling or the experience that somebody wants that, that you want somebody to have in that environment um so i i see a strong uh parallel with the way of thinking and the mindset that a lot of service designers currently have but yes. i think i feel that you're still uh feel that that's not enough we're still missing something yes we're and what still is missing that thing something. yeah um you know, I've seen some of the, the, the recent books that are coming out. You open the books, you know, filled with canvases, you know, 60 canvases, 70 canvases. And one of my friends who is very active in the field told me that there, there are as many as 100 canvases right now. This is a fragmented view. It means that you're dealing with fragments here, right? Um, the same thing is with, uh, if you look at the sustainability field, we're suffering from the same problem there. We have the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and they are divided into 16, 17 different categories, neatly packed, separated from one another. But in reality, if you in improve, for instance, poverty, it's going to touch on sanitation, it's going to touch on education, and, and the other way around, right? So you cannot do just one thing. What we are lacking in the field is a theory. And what I mean by a theory is not an academic view. Anything we are capable of doing in the outer world is a result of a theory, is an understanding of how the world functions, the world's within or the world's without. So we lack that holistic theory that can connect us across these layers that we talked about, the layer that starts with mental models, assumptions, worldviews, 
results in creation of structures, results in emergence of patterns, and then at the top mm -hmm. we have the event. Something that can, a thread that can help us connect across these levels. This is what we're lacking. And yep. I believe systems thinking, systems thinking and the theories that exist in systems thinking world are, are a very powerful, let's say, source of inspiration mm. for seeing and mapping these connectivities. Got it. So, uh, and you all already mentioned it, but the thing that we're missing is sort of the foundational layer upon which we make decisions, for instance, within the service design process. Well, now the service design process might be very uh, compartmentalized and very uh, methodology and tool driven, just following the recipe without actually thinking and considering at first, what is the kind of experience that you want to create? And, yes. and that foundational layer is the thing that you see in systemic design. Yes, absolutely. I, I see it there because um, it, can, it can enable us see connections, interrelationships. There is so many interrelationships in a, let's say, in a service context. The relationships between the designer and the artifact, right? Between the artifact and the users, between the users and the designer, right? There is layers after layers of relationships that need to be mapped and understood, right? We, we lack the language of interrelationships in, in the field. And, and this is the reason why we have all these fragments of templates. I wouldn't call them methodology because methodology is of a much higher grade in, let's say, in an academic uh, classification they of are ideas. They are recipes. 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 Recipes, we can say, uh, let's say, procedures or, or templates or checklists that need to be used. We need to tap into something which is richer, you know, in order to somehow embody those, uh, let's say, insights required for seeing complexity and feeling comfortable with complexity, we need to tap into a theory which is much richer. And we need to be creating our own tools. You know, I see some sort of a consumptionism, not only in buying uh, stuff that people are doing more than ever, but also in using intellectual products, right? We are consuming these many tools and templates that emerge every now and then. And one thing which is, in my opinion, common between all of them is that they disappear, you know? No one talks about balance the scorecard anymore. No one talks about strategy maps anymore. I do. Those were the, the <laughs> things. Oh, you do, okay. <laughs> so uh, the one that comes from many years ago, I'm talking about the one that is for a decade ago, or maybe there's a new tool, a new tool right now that is called like that as well. But uh, yeah, they, they pass. Yeah, they are, they are fads and, and they go away. I always give the uh, analogy of music. I say classical music. It's always been there, will always be there because mm. it has tapped into some sort of richness. What is the timeless, timeless aspect of the methodologies and the tools and the foundations that we use? Now, yeah. uh, maybe we can, uh, I, could you help me to make it a little bit more tangible? So if I want to start thinking and designing on a systemic level, what are some... Uh, you mentioned uh, not methodologies, but what was your uh, the word that you use? Uh, theories that the te I techniques. techniques techniques series. Say. Yeah, I, I know you have a six week course uh, on this, so you we will not be able to teach uh, systemic design in uh, a few minutes here. But what are some things that I could start doing and maybe start learning about to actually start doing this? Yeah, I would say. When you think about systems thinking, systems thinking is a lens, is an attitude, okay? There could be a wide variety of techniques that come under the umbrella of systems thinking. One of them, for instance, is understanding emergences. Emergence is a very powerful thing. Now, um, imagine water, right? Water, neither hydrogen, hydrogen nor oxygen have uh, qualities of liquid. But when they come together, water emerges out of two gases. This is emergence, right? So the wetness that we experience is the result of our interaction with water. So wet is 
our world. It's not the world of oxygen. It's not the world of hydrogen, right? The same is with, with NaCl, you know? The saltiness is the result of the emergence of the molecules that we experience as observers, as people who interact with that, as something which is salty. For some people, it may not be salty, or some people, it may be too salty, right? So this is an emergence. We need to understand emergence. The, 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 let's say the essence of systems thinking can be expressed as one of the techniques understanding and mapping emergences. How? technical properties of a service assemble together and they result in something which is not at all technical. It's something which is very subjective. It's something which is um, context dependent. It's, it's something which is observer dependent. Understanding this linkage is a big jump. It's how, one of the... Yeah, could you give an example of how, a technique that allows us to do that? Yes, yes. Imagine we have technical properties of a, of, a, of a service. This is the things that we know. For instance, uh, if you talk about the service that we derive from an uh, iPhone, there's a whole bunch of technical components that as users, we do not know, okay? So those are the, the parts of the service or the product that are related to the vocabulary of the, let's say the designer, the, the world of the designer, okay? Then there are parts of the service or the product that emerge, right? Those are the tangible dimensions, the properties of that, right? And from this point on, we can start seeing, okay, what type of interactions individuals have with the tangible parts, all right? So there is this tangible part of a service or a product that connects the technical part to the subjective part. And in the subjective part, we need to be a bit more precise in defining the type of emergences, you know? Uh, that's why um, I use a lot of analytical psychology uh, in expressing emergences when it comes to uh, human behavior. We perceive things through our sensation or intuition, right? And then we act upon or assess things through our feeling or thinking. So we need to understand if, if we are in, let's say, in contact with a tangible service or a product, what type of intuitions or sensations are evoked? by that product for us, right? We have to uh, characterize those. And what type of feelings or thinking do we employ to assess that input of information about this? So this, let's say, sensation, intuition, or uh, basically feeling thinking is the way we perceive and we assess. And this gives us a system of readiness for action, right? Then we act upon a service. So, our actions at the end of the day depend on the assessment method, the perception, the tangible dimensions of the service that are not perceived equally the same way for different individuals, of course, right? And then they are connected to the, let's say, technical properties or technical components of the service, right? So the act, this, is, this is a line that shows some connectivity, right? And then you might want to ask yourself, what type of benefits would those actions create for the designer? So it's a reverse, let's say, method. You have to ask yourself as a designer, what type of actions do I want my, uh, let's say, customers to take? Mm -hmm. What is it that I want them to do, basically? Now, what, how can I walk, walk backwards or work my way backwards to understand how those actions can emerge out of their assessment and perceptions and the tangible dimension of the service that I choose to show to them or to expose to them, right? So basically, these are the type of ways that we can, we can start looking at services differently and we see some connectivity across them. And as you said, this is something that cannot be expressed in a short period of time, but just to give you a taste of uh, what we mean by uh, multidisciplinary and interconnectivity and somehow weaving in different uh, worldviews together. This is just a simple example that I thought could be useful. Hmm. And uh, the first thing when you started talking about an iPhone is um, that came to my mind was, okay, the notifications, that's an, uh, uh, an artifact that is sort of designed with a specific intent in mind. And you could say that it's a, it triggers a subjective uh, sensation, most people will probably want to uh, press on it because they feel uh, a specific uh, fear of missing out or something like that. And when you uh, just focus on the uh, 
uh, read, unread uh, number of messages on your iPhone and you might think, okay, that's just, that's the layer. But what mm -hmm. you're actually saying is you have to sort of uh, peel back all the layers that are behind this and it starts with what is the user trying to achieve and what maybe am I as an organization trying to achieve and then sort of the the visual icon or the uh, 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 vibration on your phone is eventually just one expression to trigger that evoke exactly. that sensation exactly yeah we, this is the starting point that is the starting point from that point on you have to start following and that's why i believe understanding users at the persona level is not enough at all we need to understand people not personas and persona in latin is a mask that is worn by an actor in a in a, in a play and that mask changes from one act to another act from one play to another so the same way the mask we wear in our lives, the way we, the mask we wear when we are home, the mask we wear when we are working with our colleagues, the mask we wear when we are dealing with our boss at work or friends, they're different. We cannot understand an individual based on a single mask. We need to dive deep into those psychological processes that I mentioned about perception and assessment. So I, I have an interesting take on personas because I know it's a much debated topic in the design space. When you say we have to understand people at a at a people level, at a personal, a human level, I totally uh, agree. The challenge we have is we cannot design solutions for the needs of every individual. So we have to sort of generalize things in order to deliver stuff. Yes. What, how? What is your take on that? Well, there is two two points here, Mark. You can generalize things with the knowledge of the nuances that exist in your uh, basically target customer base. You know, you understand the nuances. What we, what we uh, try to do in our training is that we have a service and we want to show to, to, to people that this service can be perceived and assessed in eight distinct ways, completely different, right? Very, very different ways of approaching this in terms of perceiving it, in terms of assessing it, okay? Now, a designer can choose to design for the common denominator of, let's say, the target audience that it has with that knowledge in mind. So, okay, now I know what's, what type of response I will expect because each of those eight ways of, let's say, interpreting or perceiving or acting upon the service will result in different types of actions as well, you know? A person who is a thinking type, introverted thinking type, right? This individual is going to look a lot into conceptual world, into the world of ideas, right? He is, this is his world. What type of actions can we expect from him? Very different from someone who is a sensation type and he's, for, for instance, has a high degree of extroversion, right? These are the type of, um, this understanding will help us fine tune the type of responses we need. And then we can embed some ideas for, this, for some people with that disposition, with some people with this disposition. We cannot design something for everybody that because it becomes something for nobody at the end of the day if you design it for everyone. But then you have to ask yourself, what type of individuals, broadly speaking, with what common disposition, psychological dispositions, will be attracted to what I'm doing here? What, what is it? What is, who, who are? my target audience? Are there people in, more or less with this, let's say, set up in, when it comes to their mental apparatus or are they differently set up? Yeah, so what you're, my interpretation of what you're saying is uh, there's nothing wrong with generalizing for who you're designing. We need to do that. The thing that we need to keep in mind is the mental models of the people we're designing for. Yeah, we should have a refined understanding of who uh, basically is going to um, interact with our service. And you know what? But there when are many comes... ways, sorry to interrupt you, but of course yeah. there are many ways to describe a who. We're already describing a who. There are many ways to do that. And that's where we need a theory to tell us distinctly, let's say, specific ways in order to categorize individuals in a way that we don't lose any of that those essential properties. I give you a, an example from sure. movies. A movie 
we might imagine a movie is for a general audience, but um, actually, when you dive deep into movies and you understand, you, you try to understand them from a lens of psychology, then you see that there are elements in the movie that speak to this type. There are elements, the music speaks to that type, right? The settings, the scenes, the makeup, the plot. So there's so many things you can play around with a movie. And at the end of the day, there are different ways of engaging different audiences, right? Not Maybe they don't know exactly how they're being engaged because sometimes it works at a subconscious level with them. But in a lot of movies, that understanding exists in the mind of the design. They may consciously choose to put aside a target group. So, okay, this is not who we are going to work with in this, in this specific, let's say, setting. But that knowledge is essential. And you know what, Mark? There's another part of that knowledge which is very important as well when it comes to the compatibility of the service with the service designer. Mm. That is something that we, whenever we talk about human-centered design, we talk about customers. But the first human that engages with the service is the designer. So the first customer of the service is the designer of the service. So we have to understand that compatibility. There is a lot of talks about startups failing because of not finding market opportunities, competition, technical, technical deficiency, and so on and so forth. My claim is that a big reason why startups fail is the lack of compatibility between the psychological disposition of the designers in the startup and the thing they want to achieve or they want to do. If that fit doesn't exist, this is not going to work and no one talks about it. No one talks about the importance of it. No one talks about measuring that fit. No one talks about approaching it from a theoretically sound way that can give us a clear cut understanding of what's going on in terms of that compatibility. So that's a really interesting take. And I agree with you that I haven't heard a lot of people uh, talking about the compatibility between the design and the thing uh, they're designing, designing for designing. Before getting too much into detail, what would be a way to assess that compatibility on like, how do you even express that? Well, um, there are basically some uh, very useful psychological assessment tools out there. Right. Um, as a part of my study, I worked in a in a in a group to fine tune one of these tools, and that is one of the tools that we are using in in our training as well. Um, the tool gives us a very uh, basically clear understanding of what are the relative enjoyment level. You know, it's not about capacity of individuals. At the end of the day, it's about how much do they enjoy something relative to other stuff. Right. For instance, for me, is learning. I know nothing can top that because I have an introverted thinking disposition, right? That clearly speaks for itself. So I should be involved in anything that is education related, right? Learning related, teaching and stuff like this. This is very clear. So because I enjoy that, it's not because I can't do other stuff. It's because I enjoy it. So there are tools that we could use. Some of the very famous ones are not as theoretically sound as, uh, let's say, or as accurately measuring those um, dimensions that need to be measured, but there are very good tools that exist in the market that can actually do that, but they're not very well known. Hmm. So by, by taking that, then you can clearly see what you enjoy most in your life, right? And, and this, in yeah. my opinion, that needs to be linked to what you do. If you want to inspire people, you can do other stuff as well. You can probably pull it off, right? Do it well, right? Meet the, let's say, uh, acceptance requirements, but you will not inspire. Right. That's the thing. Going back yeah. to the beginning of our yeah. conversation, if that fit doesn't exist, you will not be able to inspire others. And this uh, uh, know yourself, that's that's the first starting point of designing. And this reminds me of a conversation which was quite recent here on the show where we were talking about uh, applying game design theory and game design methodologies in the world of service design. And, in, in game design, it's quite known that there are certain types of gamer profiles. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is basically something similar. There are different types of personalities within the design community. And you have to, it helps when you know what type of profile you are so that you can align the challenges you work on, the methodologies you use uh, with, with yes. who you are. Absolutely. And you know what, Mark? Once you have that knowledge, you can configure teams based on that. See, okay, this is my dark spot. This is something I can't do personally. But I can employ someone 
who can do that? Then I can focus on what I enjoy doing, right? Yeah. So we cover each other's weaknesses. So that is also a very good tool for creation and configuring teams and for avoidance of tension between some, some team members. Because if someone has my exact opposite psychological disposition, okay, there, uh, there's a lot of projection, negative projection between me and that individual that is going to hinder the collaboration between us. But once we know this tension exists, we can have an intermediary person who has some disposition that allows for a communication between me and that individual. So it's also pretty useful in configuring teams. And then on the other hand, then you can go and work on the, on the let's say, in the typology of, uh, let's say, the customers, understand the customer's world. What typologies are we after? We cannot be after everyone. We have to define it precisely. And this can help us understand at least these are the top three typologies that we can address very well with what we are doing. This is uh, sort of the, the, the big challenge in, I think, the way service design and especially design thinking is presented these days. Like the, what you see is a superficial layer, like you said, the canvases, all the toolkits, all the method cards. Um, and those are really easy to grasp. They look nice. Uh, you can really quickly uh, get your hands dirty and start working yeah. with them. But at some point, you'll run into challenges that have nothing to do with the methodologies you use. They'll have something to do with the fact that you don't have uh, theories that help you to understand the challenge. And like you just told, uh, that you don't have theories that help you to understand yourself. And I, yeah. right? Absolutely. I, I fully agree. You know, the problem, again, if you want to look at it from a systemic point of view, you know, this one, one canvas is an event. This trend of emergence of canvases is basically a pattern of behavior that we are seeing right now. What is the mental model that is giving rise to these, let's say, all these publication houses or all these universities promoting them? In my opinion, the mental model down there is that people want immediate results. Right, I want something now. Right, this instant gratification, which exists by you know, which is somehow fulfilled by shopping, you know, mm. buying things immediately, delivered to you in, in 30 minutes, whatever, is also showing itself in the world of learning as well. People do not learn for the sake of learning. They want, they don't want to invest in, in they invest in property, they invest in different things. But when it comes to learning, you know, you have to invest. You have to pour time into ideas so that you know they incubate and then you can use them you know you can build your own tools around them and then change your mindset you know in my opinion uh, we should ask you know pe people ask me what's what is design i would say we should ask ourselves when is design design is happening when the mindset of designer has changed at the end of the design something fundamental about the worldview of the designer has shifted some sort of a transformation has occurred in the designer. A metamorphosis has occurred. If it is, has not occurred, no design has taken place. Problem solving probably has taken place. Continuous improvement might have taken place. Reconfiguration, restructuring, right? Of, of different, let's say, products or processes have, might have taken place. But design, design deals with creating significance. The word shares a root with designate significance in French, which is signification, which means meaning. So there has to be a subjective, profound human dimension to design that needs to shift as a result of the act of design. And it will not shift if you're using a template. As you said, you use it quickly. It takes you five minutes to, to learn it. There's a very, let's say, short learning curve for it. But then what are the, what are the outcomes? What can you get out of it? What can you transfer into the next project? How have you changed? Right? These are the things that will not be accomplished. And I, uh, yeah, it's, I can imagine uh, it's a lot to grasp. And it's, uh, I was thinking, like, what is an easy way to start? And my answer for everybody who's listening is have a really um, critical look at the books that you're reading at this moment, the medium posts that you're reading at this moment. Are you reading books where, the tools and methodologies are presented or are you reading books that help you to understand who you are as a person as a designer uh are you are you reading books that explain 
theories and fundamental uh, principles rather than uh, things that you can start applying the next day. I think I, I was just looking for a starting point uh, mm. here. Would you agree yeah, or would you have another absolutely. suggestion no, here? No, absolutely. That's, that's great stuff. And what I would always say, you know, um, to my students is that if you want to learn systems thinking, you stay away from anything that is called systems thinking. If you want to learn about design thinking or design, stay away from any book that has it in the title because these are meta disciplines. You have to see them in a context to understand them. And I would say we have to look for wisdom generation mechanisms in our lives. Wisdom, by definition, is context neutral. If you have learned something, then you can apply it in a different, in a completely different context, then something has grown on the wisdom dimension. If it's bound by a specific context, a specific, let's say, time of usage, and there's an expiration date on it, that is not wisdom. That is probably some disconnected pieces of information that you have picked up and it will be gone. So I would say test the relevance of the ideas, the rigor of the ideas, by the possibility of cross-fertilize them in different contexts, if it's possible, if you can apply it to your own life, right? Many people say, okay, we want to solve this problem of business and whatever. And, you know, some of the people who take my courses at the end of the course say, oh my God, I never expected to undergo some personal transformations taking this course. And, and this is what we do not advertise. You say, okay, this is a course about, let's say, uh, systemic design. But um, at the same time, those ideas have relevance for our personal lives. The pattern of relationships immediate to us in our setting, right? In our, let's say, homes before in our offices. And I think we need uh, the courses like you're running, the programs that I running to give people an excuse to undergo this experience because it's really hard to invest in to yourself into learning some fundamental principles um, when you are sort of driven uh, and uh, yeah pursued in a world where short-term uh, results are expected from you like yeah so we we need more excuses to allow to allow ourselves to invest in in those kind of things yeah um, yeah yeah one small addition I, I had when you mentioned this is i mentioned like you need to read different books and you said something about standing the test of time. Like if you pick up a book and it's not at least 20 or 30 years old about a specific discipline, you might want to reconsider. Like pick up books from the 60s if they are still yeah. uh, relevant and if they are still best-selling and seen as an authority, then you probably want to uh, dive into, into them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is absolutely, Mark, you know, there is this sentence by Wolfgang Pauli, the physicist, quantum physicist who says what's still older is always the newer and this is very paradoxical at the same time very meaningful it means you go back and find those timeless stuff and most of them most of them are not from these recent years these things pop up and they disappear you know but those timeless things will always stand the test of time because they result in transformations inside individuals before products or services you know, we, 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 we are obsessed with this outer world dimension. Everything is out there. The service is out there. The, the praise is out there. Satisfaction comes from outside. And that's why there is not much investment in ourselves. You know, there is not much understanding of what's going on inside. This inner world is not explored fully. Nothing can be, let's say, transformational for the users if it's not the result of the transformation inside a designer. When I teach a course, Mark, I always teach my, change my teaching material. Because I say, if I do not learn new things in my classes, how can I expect my students to learn new things? So this cannot be a one-sided thing. I need to be challenged, equally challenged, as uh, the same way that my students are challenged in the course so that we can all learn. Otherwise, learning does not occur if it, for them if it does not occur for me. So this is something that may be a bit sounding metaphysical or hippie or whatever, but this is the essence. This is the principle according to which I operate. And it's, it's made things very fulfilling and pleasant for me. 
that sounds like a very good promise uh, to start investing in this. We, uh, Arash, uh, agreed to run uh, additional webinar based on our conversation here because there's a lot to explore. We want to give the audience an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, I'm sure this will raise a lot of eyebrows. So um, depending on when you're listening to this episode, the webinar might already have been uh, recorded and done, or you might still have an opportunity to sign up and join uh us live check the show notes for the details of the webinar we'd love to have you here um arash how would you summarize our conversation in the last hour well i i really liked it it was a it was very fluid for me um i really like conversations like this when you don't know where it's going to end you know what direction is going to take um I think what you're doing is very valuable, Mark, you know, bringing different point of views into the field and uh, these dialogues that, that it was, I would say it was a very good example of a dialogue, which is a free flowing movement of meaning. If you go back to the meaning, the etymology of the word. So I think it was, it was very meaningful for me, the questions that you asked. I hope I could uh, respond to them adequately because um, we didn't have any, uh, let's say, visual aids, some slides or, or pictures to be added. I hope this made sense to our users. I would tell them that um, I, the way I would summarize what I said is that basically, you know, we have, you, you might have heard about this hero's journey, you know, the hero venturing into the unknown and then coming back with a boon, with a gift, with an elixir. I would say we should have a pattern law called designer's journey, a designer's journey into the unknown, into the world of learning growth, into a world where we learn how to hold tensions, right? Between wanting to do something immediately and investing into something which is more profound and time, uh, let's say time taking. In a world, venturing into a world and getting accustomed to a world where we have more tolerance for ambiguity, we have more tolerance for uncertainty and we are comfortable with complexity. This is, I would say, what a designer is, a person who is comfortable in the face of complexity. You can dive right into it. Some of my PhD students come, come to me and tell me, you know what, we are lost. We don't know what we're doing. We are confused. I said, beautiful. That's exactly how you should be in the journey of your doctoral studies if you're not this is not research, it's just a simple search. So I would say design is about developing this tolerance for confusion, for um, not knowing, being comfortable with not knowing, finding meaning in not being able to understand immediately the meaning of something. So these are some of the ideas that I try to live by uh, in my everyday life, in my, uh, let's say, in the courses that we've designed and the type of work that we do. And they have been really fulfilling and really helping me in my journey of individuation. So it's uh, some final words. I hope this makes sense. Yeah. And I think you just dropped the title of the episode. I've already noted it down here. Uh, Arash, once again, thanks uh, for sharing this. I'm looking forward to seeing you in the webinar. That's going to be fun as well. Uh, thanks for coming on. If you want to be part of the follow-up webinar that Arash and I are running, make sure to check the show notes down below and find the link where you can register for the webinar or where you can find the recording. Apparently you're enjoying conversations like this, so click that subscribe button and make sure you don't miss any future episodes. Thanks a lot for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.